All right. <laughs> Welcome to our show. <laughs> Andre, um, what, are, what are we seeing here? What is, what, is, uh, what is this? What you're seeing here is you're seeing a bunch of engineering love. So I come from the engineering world, Cisco, and we know that we got to get in front of our customers. Most of them are like to geek out. And so what you're seeing here is a demand generation event, Itai. Uh, it's, a, it's from the field for the field type demand generation. We invite a bust, bunch of customer operations folks in. We have our field uh, educate them, take them through the learn experience uh, type of a, an engagement. And uh, hopefully they check a box on a survey indicating they want to follow up. All right, we'll get there. It's uh, far away, you're taking us to the future, but we'll start from the beginning. Who are you? Yeah, so I'm Andre Laurent. I run uh, worldwide engineering sales for Cisco Systems. Uh, I manage Cisco's biggest uh, business, which is the core business, routing, switching, uh, wireless, all of the core technologies. Um, primarily responsible for educating all of the engineering community within Cisco, but also within our partner organizations. So uh, we set that strategy to make sure that they go to market in a way that's relevant to our customers. Uh, they have everything that they need uh, when they engage with the customer. That could include demonstration capabilities. It, inc it could include uh, playbooks for how to conduct effective workshop. Um, maybe an architecture type workshop. Uh, Cisco is really making a lot of changes, Itai, so we're really focused on business outcomes and ensuring that our field is engaging with relevancy, relevancy putting that first and not leading with products. So I think people are very, would be very curious to learn, when was the last time you took a haircut? Oh uh, man. Well, you know, I'm lazy. I think you shave it every day, you know. I, but uh, these days I'm a lot lazier. And, you know, I would say it's probably been like 24 years since I've had any hair on this head. All right. Yeah, more than this, at least. Um, uh, this is me, Itai. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Follows. We work uh, with uh, Cisco, uh, with Andre, Andre's team and, and, and other teams. Um, uh, I, I've not been taking haircuts since, I think, 21 years uh, from now. So we have a lot in common already. Um, but you know what? Let's start the story from the very beginning. Uh, and this is a whole journey that we work on together in the last uh, three years, three actually years, even yeah. a little bit more uh, than that. The first stop is, is what we call the, the, the one voice. And uh, maybe tell the audience first, uh, what was the challenge back in 2016, 2015? What, were, what were, were you looking to solve? Yeah, Itai, so Cisco is a large company. I mean, we're not the largest company. We have customers that are much larger than us, but it's a huge company with you know, 19,000 plus sellers. And the way that we're organized within Cisco is we have several different um, product line management groups. Uh, that are responsible for going to market with certain types of products. So the number of SKUs that we have, the number of products that we have, it's tremendous. And everybody wants a voice to get in front of the, to the, the field, our primary sellers. And so what happens is it just becomes very noisy. And the field doesn't really understand, you know, what the overall strategy is and how they should go to market and what matters and what doesn't matter. And so the biggest challenge we've had is how do you, how do you limit the noise, focus the field, because you know, if you look back to 2016, it's Cis one of Cisco's largest launches. I mean, if you look at our stock price right now, we're, we're breaking records again. I mean, we're, we're over $50 a share. Um, that's, not, that's, that's not happening just because you know, the market is you know, improving. It's happening because we're making a transition from hardware to, to software-led um, sales. But how do you focus the field? And so that was the biggest challenge in front of us is we need, to be able to, we need a better way to focus the field, to empower the field, to enable them to go to market more effectively, and we need to do it in a way where we have a dashboard to be able to see what's working and what's not working. We, we, we understood right away that it's going to be a journey. That there are some cultural shifts that need to happen within the organization. There are some changes in the overall processes. We're engaging with different types of people. Uh, you know, some of them are millennials. Some of them are, you know, they've been around for a long time. And everybody is you know, at a different place in terms of absorbing the, the change necessary. But our biggest launch, we had to focus. So, so this was the launch back then, right? DNA, which, uh, which, uh, which was a, a huge launch. And, and when they called us and, and said, okay, we have to align everybody, every single seller, 19,000 salespeople, and potentially also some, some partner sellers, right? How do we align all of them? And we came back and said, okay, let's build a content-centric campaign internally that would nurture the sales team over a period of uh, six to eight weeks and get them knowledgeable on exactly what is going to happen in that specific campaign. Sounds simple, right? You send a few emails and everybody's reading that. But you'll see in a minute that it's not that, that simple. What we actually did here is created, a, with, with the false technology, we created a content page, actually one for every region, 
ac across the globe. The emails came from the sales leaders. They also used the other channels that uh, Andrew is probably going to talk about uh, later on, how they distributed th that co content. This is connected to their SSO system, so we know exactly which person is going in, so we can track every salesperson's uh, engagement. And then there is also a quiz connected to that and the prize, so now we can actually uh, 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 track everything down to the, to, the, to the results, right? And the results at first, in, in the first day of launch, there was a lot of uh, happiness from the point of view of the number of engagements and content consumption, but it was only a fraction of the sales team that actually paid attention. The first thing that Cisco came back to us, they said, it doesn't work because we have only 10% of the sales team of 19,000 uh, people pay attention. How can we go to the market with such a huge and important launch with only 10% of our uh, sales team paying attention? Well, we came back and said, you have to be a little bit patient because it's not that the system doesn't work. What is it that just that the first time that you know what doesn't work? And what we need to do is to keep nurturing them like if it was any other customer audience. It's the same thing. These are 19,000 very busy people with a lot of uh, uh, different noisy environment in front of them. So let's keep on nurturing them. After about eight weeks, we got the vast majority of the sales team ready to go. And we were always also were able to prove that there was a clear correlation between the, the success of the quiz and the engagement with, with the content. All that was happening with a scorecard for sales leadership all the time, they knew exactly what is going on in each one of the regions, where they need to push, where it's absolutely fine. And, and it, was, it was the first time that was a very, very um, um, kind of uh, well-known effort within, within Cisco. Ita, I would yeah. say that it was the first time as a company that we really put accountability and inspection first. Because we didn't have the capabilities before to dig in easily. But with the follows tool and, and the way that we packaged everything, in a central place, so all, all sellers knew exactly where to go, exactly what to focus on. Uh, we could track um, their engagement, and we could then communicate that to the leaders who these people report through, so that they could then continue to carry the message, and we could communicate more effectively as an overall organization. Because there's no way that there's one person or two people in the company that can drive the entire field to, to make these kinds of changes, or to go and focus on something. And I think it was key to have the messaging coming directly from the, the sales leadership specific right. to the geos and the regions and the teams because typically if my boss is asking me to look at something, I'm going to go and I'm going to look at it. If someone else is asking me to look at something, well, you're one of you know, 1,000 people that I have 1,000 email, unread emails in my inbox asking me to look at one more piece of content. I just don't have the time. Yep. Yeah. So this was the very first uh, uh, kind of attempt at that and then it be actually became a standard. You want to tell a bit how it came about? Yeah, so it, based on the effectiveness of that, that campaign, we recognized right away that we need to be a lot more, I mean, focus doesn't mean I need you to look at this, I need you to look at that, I need to look at everything. So we needed to really make some di difficult decisions as an organization. What is the most meaningful and relevant content at this period of time for our, for our stakeholders? What's going to truly empower them? If they don't get value out of it, then they're not going to come back. So we made sure that we put the right type of content out there. And then I started thinking about how do we continue to put um, momentum behind what could potentially become a movement within the organization. I'm big on that. I, I like to be a, f a first follower, if you will. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that TED talk. It talks about leadership and, you know, it's not the lone nut that's out there doing something crazy. That's the real leader. It's, it's the lone nut that's embracing the first followers and making sure that the first followers then attract the masses to come um, and, and, and take part in what we really should care about, which is driving a movement. And so I'm a big fan of that. I want to be a first follower if possible. So these little nuts were out there with marketing, trying to figure out how to leverage you know, this tool as part of the new business capability in terms of combining the people, process, and technology. And I was looking at this and thinking, we've got to be able to do more with this. My primary stakeholder is the engineering sales community within Cisco. It's almost like an oxymoron, engineers and sales. But in technical sales, you've got to have engineers. Okay? And I recognize the same challenge that that, that we had in terms of focusing people around a launch, I face that challenge every single day when I want to empower the field to go to market more effectively. So I met with, uh, I met with Follow's team, I met with marketing, uh, and I said, look, I, I think there's something brilliant here. I, I want to be able to do, do more. I want to be able to do something very specific to the engineering organization. 
And we started off and we launched uh, what we call a 4D portal. Uh, 4D, four dimensional, but 4D also, if you think about the engineering motion, what we're asking them to do in terms of enabling them, I need them to do something, a verb. So it's discover, design, demo, and defend. And I need to focus the systems engineering community on those motions and make sure they have all of the right tools, assets, training, and those kinds of things. But I don't know if it's effective. And that was the missing piece. It's because when I communicate things out to the field, I don't know if they're consuming it. And once I plugged in follows, I had visibility. I had a dashboard. It was like I had a, driving a car and all of a sudden I could see. And if I, if I did any kind of an enablement uh, activity, maybe a virtual webinar, or I, I started going from region to region with my teams and enabling people on, on, as part of an on-location event, I could see what happened because there was always a call to action. All you have to do is go to the 4D site. All you have to do is go to the 4D site and everything you could ever want is there for you. And it took off. So, so, so far I think we have been talking about internal enablement through campaigns, through analytics, uh, and, and all these different, different motions. But then we wanted to take it one big step forward, right? To say, okay, it's great for the internal alignment, internal enablement of all your salespeople and sales engineers, but how can you actually start using that for outbound, for like actually communicating with, with your customers, right? Um, and from your point of view, what did you see then? Yeah, so again, this is one of those areas where, again, I was, uh, I would say, one of the first followers because I wasn't the one that was out there trying to figure this out. The marketing was working with Follow's team, Edai and his team, to figure out how do we take it to the next level. Let's look at the entire journey, the entire life cycle of the overall customer engagement, the low-touch model, if you will. Um, and, and so we have a lot of data in the company. And data is meaningless unless you can action on it. And some of the data that we have within Cisco is we can see all of the last day of support information for all of the investments that our customers have made. We can look in these databases and we can track, okay, this customer's coming up on old stale equipment. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to go and target them and have a meaningful conversation. But nobody that's in sales is going to dig into databases all day long to try to figure out, okay, which ones should I target? Very few people do that. So if you think about you know, what we tell our customers, which is, hey, you need to reduce your cost and complexity, you need to innovate faster, you need to lower your risk. We started looking at that as a, with an internal lens and thinking about how can we make it easy for our sales force to take uh, advantage of the insights shared through this data and in a very simple way, reach out to customers with targeted, consistent messaging. And so we started combining many things with salesforce.com and our last day of support information and prepping uh, emails for uh, the campaign that we wanted to launch in terms of you know, outbound marketing, and the results were incredible. Um, again, it was another one of those examples where it was like, we're taking enablement, we're combining it with a outbound communication that's very targeted to a very specific audience, and the whole way through we can measure the effectiveness of, did the enablement lead to the outbound outreach? How many of the customers opened the emails that were sent? Did that then lead to some kind of a one-to-many event where the customer comes in or a one-on-one -on -one follow up? And I love data. I love data. So, and I, I, you know, it was like, I was looking at this from the side thinking, this is incredible. I, I, this, I, I want to see how I can take advantage of that as well. So, so it, it's very aligned with, with uh, uh, I think what's happening in the market around, around a, ABN, right? The, the idea of the, you know, the, all our prospects, all our customers are saturated with a very, very noisy environment. The number of emails and tweets and, and social ads and whatnot, it's just overwhelming to the point that you, you just ignore, right? So in order to really break through, you have to take all these ingredients and put them together. And Itai, one more thing. Yeah. I mean, we're a giant company. Cisco's well known. Uh, we're number one, number two in pretty much every market we play in. Uh, there are certain countries where, you know, it's not our backyard. We don't, we don't do as well, but the competition is on. I mean, it's hot. I mean, those, those, those small competitors are nipping at us constantly. Uh, we can't afford to have them you know, leapfrog us and leave us in the dust. I don't want to be in somebody's rearview mirror. So we got to get in front of that. It means we need to understand exactly who we're going after and how to uh, approach them in a relevant manner. We had to have this capability. So here's how it works. Um, in, in essence, if you remember, the, the first step was mainly in internal kind of a portal for enablement for, around a specific motion. Now, 
you also have targeting data in the same place. So you look at your database, you kind of find all those customers that are ready to make the next move, and you want to take the step before the competitor. So you bring all this data, you correlate it back with your uh, Salesforce, see what are incremental opportunities. You bring it in front of every seller, automatically personalized, with contextual enablement that tells them what is it that they need to talk about. From here, they can actually click on this blue button and then go and reach out to the specific customer. And have analytics on the back end at the right top to see exactly who is engaging with what. Use that as your signal to get to the next level. This is a machinery, right? And this is going on uh, these days at Cisco, not only on uh, this program, which is around uh, refresh of existing networks, but it's also on a whole bunch of different other uh, motions. They do it something like 12 times every quarter in different, on different accounts and different topics and so on. It is really a, a well-oiled well uh, machine. This is an example you want to mention, maybe tell oh, the I story mean, about that. Yeah. Ultimately, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves, right. okay? That's the only scoreboard we care about in sales. You know, oftentimes, you know, uh, if you look at it, I mean, in the end, anybody that's supporting a sales function, um, the leaders are going to look at these. What's the overall pipeline and what's, the, what's the, the revenue? What are the bookings? And are we accelerating sales? Uh, are we, you know, we're going to be listening to our customers to understand uh, areas where we can improve, whether it's in our product, whether it's in our, uh, the way that we engage with them, so, uh, so that's more of a consulting type engagement. But ultimately, uh, when we start doing those things right, we enable the field to go to market in the right way. Uh, you can't deny the numbers. Yeah, you can't deny yeah. the numbers. You know, this, is, this is the key. I mean, th this is the slide that I mean, is busy, but this is what I would really pay attention to is it's a life cycle. It's, it's an entire framework for a very low touch outreach model, combined enablement, everything, targeted account. Um, it's the entire package, but it doesn't have to stop there. That's just the beginning. And so that's, that's what interested me is that this is the beginning of something much more meaningful. I don't get in front of a customer with a marketing message, uh, even if it's coming from their account team who they're comfortable with, um, I don't close a deal based on that. Okay, I might identify an opportunity and some interest, but I don't know, is it you know, committed pipeline? Or is it just that I have some interest? We have to be able to go beyond this. This is the start of something great. It's the start of our engagement life cycle with the customer. What about those customers that don't respond? What about those customers that do respond and they want something more meaningful? I want to be able to continue to track. I want to continue to nurture them through the learn, experience, and validate type of engagement. Because customers aren't buying because I come in front of the room and I say, give us a couple million dollars to refresh your infrastructure because we have the latest whiz bang stuff. The performance is better, the scale is better, this is better, that's better. We don't lead with product. It doesn't work. So there has to be some type of business discovery. We have to be able to share unique insights around best practices that other customers are adopting, the types of trends, the challenges, the benefits, the key capabilities that they're being influenced by. And then we need to go from there into a more meaningful engagement because the audience that we're selling to is a technical audience, it's a technical buyer. They buy based on consensus and they buy based on learn, experience, validate. They don't buy because we say that it can. They buy because they, they learn about it, they experience it, and they validate for themselves that it's relevant. And based on that, they buy. So this is the start of the journey to get in front of the customer to give them an opportunity to start learning and from there, we need to go to something that is more about experiencing and validating. So, so you know, I, I'm thinking about it. Many, many companies and many companies that we see in the market would say, well, this is, this is the holy grail. This is the end of it. That's where we need to go. And you're saying this is just the beginning, right? What's, what's peer marketing? How, what is the, the thing that you wanted to put on top of all that? And, and of course, it takes a journey, right? It took probably like two and a half years to get to this point. But what was unique here? What was the opportunity that you found? If I'm, in a, if I'm a customer, uh, who do I trust? Do I, do I trust my account manager that's in sales? Do I trust marketing? Do I trust Cisco, the big machine? You know, we're unique. We have all of these engineers in the, in the field that are part of sales. And I said it was like an oxymoron, engineering and sales. However, these engineers, they approach every account with extreme integrity. 
they would never make a recommendation to a customer that um, conflicts with what is real and what is possible. And so they're constantly the voice for the customer inside the company. And as a result of that and having them aligned to specific accounts, they've earned uh, a seat at the table as a trusted partner. They are the true trusted partner. So when we look at our overall, the types of events that we run, sure, there's some benefits to have marketing getting in front of customers with certain messaging to get them thinking differently because there's some insights that are shared there based on you know, a lot of investment and research and things like that. Um, you know, we can lead the market, but, but in reality, it's the engineers, it's the field, it's the peer that leads the peer. And the customer is a lot more likely to follow when it's the peer. So what we decided to do is we, we decided that, you know, if we think about the customer buyer, buyer experience, again, being the engineering audience, and we started really thinking again about this learn, experience, validate journey that the customer goes on, we started thinking about how do you go from an outbound marketing campaign to a meaningful engagement that is, is not really salesy. You know, we have so many customers attend our Cisco Live events. I don't know if anybody has heard of Cisco Live, if not from technology world, you probably haven't. It's very large events, 25,000, 30,000 attendees. It's, 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 it's a network world, if you will. I mean, it's a nerd world, if you will, from, for the networking person, okay? And now that's changing. It's becoming a lot more than that with programmability and all these things. There shouldn't be a reason why we have to get in front of our customer once a year in this country or that country. We should be able to get in our customer every day. And we need to do it in a way that's relevant. So when we structure these events, we are trying to get the customer to learn about the solution capabilities and to be able to experience them firsthand. We set up uh, the demonstration environment so that every customer can get their hands dirty with the solution. When we construct the content, none of the content has anything, anything about products, licensing, software, none of that's in there. Because that's not relevant at that stage of the engagement. I'm not teaching the customer, I'm not there to educate them to do a TOI, a transfer of information. I'm there to tell them why, what, and how. And then let them experience firsthand. It's a very targeted audience. It's an operations person within a customer account. It could be a network engineer, a network architect. It could be the person that's responsible for ads, moves, and changes. How am I gonna make their job easier? How am I gonna help them to address the demands that the business has on them? What does it really mean when we start automating certain tasks? Does it mean that they lose their job or do they start using their brilliance in a different way? Uh, and they need to experience it and they need to experience it from their you know, peers and be able to ask questions around what other customers are doing and socialize ideas with other customers that are in the room. And the only thing that we ask out of that event, the only demand that we are trying to generate is demand for a one-on-one -on -one follow up engagement with an engineer. That is the only relevant, real, real relevant question on the survey because if you think about it, when we had put initially, we had experimented with this as well. When we had put, hey, do you want a, a follow-up meeting with your account manager? Eh, maybe 15% of the customers responded, I want a follow-up. When we changed that question to say, do you want to follow up with your account SE? It's north of 50%, Itai. 50 plus percent of our customers that attend these events, unique customers, request a follow-up engagement. And that allows us to get further in, uh, entrenched in the journey with the customer, to understand really what's relevant from a design perspective, to be able to do that for dimensional stuff, right? Discover, design, continue to demonstrate capabilities, and defend the position by potentially doing a proof of value engagement or some kind of pilot. And that's, that's new to a company like Cisco because we've been a hardware company for all these years. But if you think about our transition and why the stock's gone up like the way that it has, it's because we have truly made a transition to be more of a software company. And as, as, as we make that transition, it means a change in our overall capabilities, which means introducing new technology like what Follows has to offer and changing process and bringing on new kinds of talent and leveraging unique talent we have in the organization that hasn't been stretched to, um, you know, to reach their, their potential. I think, well, absolutely brilliant. I think one of the things that are so exciting for us to see is that, is that well, a any software company could take this with both hands and, and implement that immediately. But Cisco is not a software company to begin with. And the transition they made into software went so deep and so far into understanding that the go-to-market motion has to be very, very different from what it was before. So that this is really a remarkable transition that we have been able to witness, right? 
And, and maybe, maybe you want to say, kind of a, talk about your vision on how you create this huge pipeline here. Yeah. What are the, the three circles? What do they mean? I believe the only way to really convince the rest of the leadership team within the organization as big as Cisco is you have to prove it. Start small and you go big. It's all about influencing and inspiring and leveraging data. Um, we had the data, okay? We had the, the new framework and process for go to market with all of the feedback, but more importantly, it's not just the feedback from customers that I liked your event, all of the requests for follow up. And we linked all of that information into, um, tied it back to our Salesforce. So I could look over time at all of the uh, account opportunities to be able to continue to measure pipeline and revenue. There's nothing, again, that gets sales leaders more excited than pipeline and revenue, okay? And they wanna see direct correlation. That's the scoreboard again. However, our engineers also need to stay motivated. They're the ones that are delivering these sessions and facilitating them on behalf of the customer. So one of the biggest challenges in any kind of cultural shift within an organization is, is how to inspire influence the field and bring them together to get behind the movement. Okay, that's really important, it's critical. You have to be able to create some kind of sense of community. But how do you do that? I mean, we're a worldwide company, people all over the world. We had a real simple idea. We have a collaboration technology, it's called WebEx Teams. It's, it's literally like, think of uh, one-to-many messaging platform, okay? There are certain competitors like Microsoft, they have their, their offering. Uh, can't even remember the name of it, to be honest with you. Somebody's probably like, yeah, I know the name of that one. Um, so is it, like, is it like Slack? It's like Slack. Slack, okay. okay. So it's, so it's a Cisco product. I hate product. to name a competitor, but yes. But, uh, but I can, right? But yes, it's, so it's a Cisco, it's a... <laughs> bald guy going bald, I tell you yeah. what. But we're gonna take it off outside I, and we we'll back it off. I wanna but, say it, it's, yeah. it's better than Slack. I think it's better than because Slack. Because it's connected to WebEx. It's connected to WebEx, it's all integrated. You can go directly to some kind of launch into a video experience and so on. But ultimately, all joking aside, we have a community space. It's adopted by the company. It's, it's the simplest form of a community. What if we started having people post their pictures from events? What if we started integrating the, the results of the events in terms of the number of follow-ups requested and, and putting in all the pipeline data and those things so that people in the community room worldwide could see the impact that each session was having? Well, the leaders that were part of the room that were responsible for the geos were very proud. The engineers that were facilitating the event felt like they had something that was an artifact that they could use later on to be able to go after promotions. Very difficult for them to do and quantify the impact that they're having. And this entire community culture exploded. And we've used that me method um, for many different types of motions, uh, proof of value type um, initiatives and so on, programs that we run with certification. And, and so it's become a best practice for us. But we had to link that in. That's closing the loop. Because if I, if I can't keep the field motivated, uh, and, they're mo and, and think again, who I'm trying to motivate, the field meaning the engineering community, and what do they care about? That, 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 that they're doing right by the customer. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing they care about. So, so you, you know, the, the, the kind of a question of marketing and sales, how do marketing mobilize sales or work with them, align, orchestrate, connect, there's so many different words, but we know it's tough. It's very, very tough. Uh, we have seen many other examples outside of what you've done here at, at Cisco that it's, there's a lot of friction between marketing and sales. It's very, very difficult to convince sales after a while to continue in the program and to continue uh, uh, doing anything for that. I, I think it, this is a true story of leadership. Right? It's a true story of, of huge vision and, and a lot of uh, excitement created through that. So instead of trying to convince salespeople, or SEs in this case, to be part of the game, they actually want to do more, right? They want, they're, they're asking marketing do more yeah, and more and more, they're, right? they're asking, when we launched this thing, invested, I won't say how, how much money, but we invested a certain amount of money. The number With of, us, you mean? Well, not, not enough. You, I'm, saying, I'm <laughs> saying in, 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 running the, in running the events, okay? <laughs> Think about it, you, each event you have catering, all these different expenses and logistics and reporting, and we scaled that through a centralized group in the company. We, went, we partnered with a centralized group in the company called uh, Customer, customer uh, Engagement Center of Excellence. Mm. We said, we need to take this at scale. We need all the reporting, all the logistics handled, make sure all the demo workloads are up, the facilities are where they need to be, order the catering, so on. Um, and when we started launching these, the field is so into this, they're asking to be able to conduct these kinds of events almost every week. It literally 
the request came in, the demand is five times what we fund today, and we've already doubled the funding. Yep. Uh, they're saying, I, I don't care if I have to handle my own catering locally out of the geo, I just want to make sure that I can run an event pretty much every week, because this, this, this is the good stuff. This is the stuff that's real and it's important, important and the customer cares about. Yeah. It's not all the product, licensing, software stuff that, you know, it just feels way too salesy. Yeah, it's way too salesy. Very impressive. Uh, so where do you take it from here? I'd say, you know, it's, it's, it's a journey. Um, I, think, I think we're still scratching the surface. Uh, we've done some great things. I'm still looking to do more. I'm still thinking about the possibilities. You know, we expand this out to our partner organization, have them run the same kind of events. We do the same kind of uh, targeted, ena uh, targeted enablement, uh, with this, uh, leading to the same kind of motions. Again, what am I enabling the field to do? I'm enab enabling them to go to market in a relevant way. What is a test drive? It's an example of going to the market in a relevant way. Whether, whether people want to do that within a one-to-many event or whether they want to do that in a one-on-one -one -one event, all of the content, all of the, all of the structure, is, is, uh, it's, it's relevant for both. So you know, we're looking and exploring different ways to continue to connect the unconnected. Oftentimes I find people trying to innovate and they're looking for something new, like completely new. And I don't really believe that to innovate faster means to go after something completely new. I believe to innovate faster means you start connecting the unconnected. And you have the willingness to put impact before brand and be a first follower. And so you, know, you can look at all of these different components and this thing will continue to grow and these things will continue to link. And maybe none of these things, maybe none of these things change, but the way that we connect them changes. And that's, again, uh, a new innovation. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about that. Uh, seriously, a brilliant story, very impressive story of a company the size of Cisco and age of Cisco that has kind of uh, uh, reinvented itself uh, from product through go-to-market and having uh, fantastic leaders like, like yours to actually take it all the way in and, and uh, show that, that uh, even an older company can actually be uh, very modern and, and, and new and, and pave the road for, for the rest of the, of the industry. Uh, so it's, it's very inspiring to, to all of us. I, I want to finalize with, with saying, you know, this is, this is, today's the day is our mantra that is in our office. Uh, I, I used to say to our own employees all the time, today's the day. If you have to send someone an email today, do it today, don't wait till tomorrow. If you have something you have to finish, do it today. There are people from my team here that will testify that this is the case. But today's the day doesn't mean that you have to be shallow, right? Really think big. Reimagine the way that you're actually going after your customers and prospects, the way that uh, uh, Andre is doing that kind of inspiration, but you can take one step, one single step forward. You don't have to do the whole thing. You try to do the whole thing together, it's hard. You saw that at Cisco, it took like three years and it's not done. Uh, there's, there's more and more to, to, to develop. If you really have the, the vision to go, uh, to go bold and to go uh, uh, innovative, then, then think big, start one step. And, and of course, from our point of view, we'd love to be uh, your partner in that, in that uh, journey. And we're giving haircuts to anybody that wants yes. them after the session. So if you, know, you want this kind of a you that, know, that's bold look. For free. We, that's actually for free. That's actually for free. And we have, we, we have uh, stands outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we'd love to hear any, any questions, any, any ideas. Uh, yeah, good. I'm free. Thank you. I think we'll have some notes. So you talked a lot about how kind of things progressively got better and you made progress. Do you have any stories of flops and lessons learned? Yes. Here? Of course, thank you for that. Um, any kind of culture sh cultural shift, doesn't matter, just a change in process. People are, they tend to not want to move in that direction. Uh, s for example, the field uh, initially when they were sending out um, the invites to customers, they were just, they're used to sending it in PDF format. Hmm. Yeah. But, but by doing that, I can't track the, the metrics. So you know, sometimes it really re does require being extremely transparent and authentic with the stakeholder to say, you love the events, correct? Yes. And you want to do more of them, correct? You're asking me for five times the demand. Yes. How do you think that we get the investment? We get the investment by tracking and measuring the return on the investment. If you would be willing to leverage this new approach to be able to allow us to have the visibility that we need, I can continue on your behalf to build the business case 
with the rest of the organization to get you the dollars required to expand the program so that you can have your demand generation whenever you want. Mm -hmm. And that type of authenticity and transparency allowed us to, in most cases, <coughs> overcome the hurdle. Uh, you know, and it takes a long time. Sometimes getting that message out takes a long time. We need to build an evangelist base, that's another lesson learned, is there's no one individual, two individuals, or even my team of individuals that can go out and transition the field. I have to find the evangelists within the, the overall seller community to basically help with that process. Um, and so at this point, I don't have um, you know, those kinds of, the only, uh, sometimes the only types of, um, I don't have those types of, I don't have that type of resistance because the field understands how we go about getting investments and how important it is to have the metrics. Um, sometimes I do run into certain challenges with you know, our internal tools for how we block certain stuff going out and those kinds of things. I have to be very responsive. That's the other thing I learned is it takes time to be effective. Okay, everybody wants to be efficient, but it takes time to be effective. This, this is a people problem. This is a communication problem. There is no efficiency that comes before effectiveness in that. I always put the person first. So if it requires me to take extra time out of my day, I can't tell you it's gonna take me 30 minutes and we're done. Hey, let's set a meeting for 30 minutes and I'll, get, I'll sell you on this. No, sometimes it takes an hour. Sometimes it takes two calls, each one an hour. But you know what, if I can, if I can influence the right people and win them over as evangelists, mm -hmm. it's well worth it. And I learned that. I, I can say you know, from, from examples that we, ha we have seen, sometimes you know, there's a lot of excitement at first. And then at the end of it, you have one email blast. <laughs> the whole program and that ends with a, one email blast. And then, and then so say, hey, where are my leads? Well, they're not waiting out the door, right, with one email blast. You have to think more holistically. Uh, I think here, for instance, you, you hear about a fundamental thesis of engineers to engineers, small groups, no sales-ish, uh, give before you take. There's a whole bunch of different components to, the, uh, to this engagement strategy that eventually bring the, the leads and then the bookings and, and so on. And regularly right? close the loop, the right. community space, the pictures, I mean, that's, that's creating evangelists in the field. So, so you have to keep faithful to your, to your strategy, to the, your innovative strategy, and not just settle for, hey, let's send one email and we'll see. Because then sales would actually, sales would push back in a minute. The, if, if you set the expectation with sales too low, you say, hey, you're going to send one email, it's going to be fantastic. They send one email, say, hey, where are my leads? That's the last email they did. And don't, right. another one I learned actually, Itai, I don't want to rat hole too much, but I will say the other thing that we learned from this was, don't, we have a vision, I'm, very, I'm guilty of this. I have a vision. I see the North Star. I want to get there now. I'm impatient, okay? I, I, I really want to nail it. I want the whole thing today. Why? Because we can do it but the field can't embrace it. So it's understanding you know, where I am is necessarily where my stakeholders are. It's part of the overall acceptance uh, of the changes required or a new process is required. So I think the stepping stone of starting with the enablement, using the platform, and then moving into the targeted marketing, and then moving into linking it to the demand generation, and each one of those was proof point built on top of one another. Had we tried to do it all at once, right out of the gate, I don't believe we would have been successful because it's too many, too many types of, um, of too, much, too much pushback that I have to address, too many different, I'm fighting on too many fronts. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Yeah. Did you notice through that process um, that demand gen marketing was up in your game as you guys were kind of diving in with them? Or did you not even maybe notice before? What's so interesting is, you know, well, you had mentioned sales and marketing sometimes can, you know, we can do like that. And, um, and, and I think a couple of years, it was right around that, right just before that time, we started having more uh, brain trust oriented type meetings where you had multiple uh, members from the different groups within you know, Cisco coming together, sitting around the table, really looking at the big picture in terms of what it is we were trying to accomplish. And what role do you play looking at the overall race, if you will? You know, who's responsible? Who's accountable for what? Do you need to be consulted? Uh, am I going to inform you? I mean, that's what I mean by race. Uh, we, so we started really looking at that. And by looking at it as a community on a regular basis then and having the regular um, 
meetings, we were able to close the loop. So oftentimes those meetings were working sessions. I think once we started doing that, marketing started thinking, well, hell, I could spend my dollars elsewhere. I'm investing all of this money in these roadshow type activities, but I can't be as effective as the field leading this for me. So at this point, you know, it really depends on the culture of the organization and their readiness to, again, put impact before brand because marketing could have easily come and said, stop stepping on our toes. What do you think you're doing? This is ours. We own it. We're accountable. You know, who the hell you think you Never are? Happened, and right? <laughs> you guys better stop doing that. And you know what? They, they didn't do that. Yeah. They said, you know, what? let's see what this is. We'll continue to do our thing. We'll watch to see what's going on over here. Um, you know what? I see the results. Okay, let's learn a little bit more about what you're doing over here. Let's learn a little bit more about what you're doing here. And we still get the occasional, hey, do you mind uh, changing the content, inserting this product information in there? No, we're not going to do that. Because <laughs> uh, you're missing the point. That's not what we're, try we're trying to do. However, what we can do is give you information on which, which customers want the follow-up mm -hmm. and ways that you can potentially further help us as part of sales to enable the field with you know, the right collateral. Let's jointly work on that. So it led to a more collaborative yeah. type of a, um, experience with, with, with marketing because the, the personalities weren't so, uh, they weren't resistant to, to uh, collaborating as part of like focusing on a movement. Because traditionally everybody's like, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And they don't want to collaborate. And I don't know if it's a, certain companies, if it's a, if it's a brand thing, uh, meaning, you know, I, I don't want to judge anyone. Uh, everybody's motivated by different things. And if you look at a cult culture of different organizations, some core organizations reward and recognize brand. Um, and, and it's not always recognizing and rewarding results and outcomes and quantifying things. So, you know, fortunately for us, I work at a company and, you know, we, we recognize impact. Um, and, you know, it, it's not in every corner of the company like that, but for the most part, we're like that. So it's not the norm to not be like that. All right, thank uh, you very much. Appreciate if you have any time. questions, thank you. Love you.